It's a heated debate about how to improve K-12 education, and comparisons between traditional schools and charter schools are at the center of that swirl. Charters are a small percentage of the nation's schools, but now a permanent fixture with more than 6,000 charter schools across the country. We're going to dig into this issue with Allison Fansler. She is president and COO of KIPP DC, which operates 15 schools and is part of a na nationwide network of charter schools, aiming to prepare students in underserved communities for college. And John Dacey is superintendent in residence at Broad Center for the Management of School Systems. He ran the Los Angeles Unify Unified School District until last fall. They're here with The Atlantic's Steve Clemens. Hey, great to be with both of you. That's such a cool title, superintendent in residence. Did, did, did you make that, or did they, did they offer that as part of the gig? They offered that. Yeah, they, 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 that's, that's, a, that's a good title. I like that. Thank you very much for joining here. John, I understand that you are someone, at least in the Los Angeles uh, arena, the greater LA area, has closed more charter schools than anyone. Uh, yeah, we, um, during my administration... It's not the whole story, Which but was <laughs> four years, we yeah. opened more charter schools at right. any particular time, and also closed the highest number of low-performing ones. So you're... you're, you're uh, t tell us how that works, because when you're superintendent, and I, one of the things we were talking about, Allison, before we came up, I asked, how does being... I mean, is the superintendent kind of like the Pope? Like, are you infallible? Uh, I guess not in your case, but, but yeah. you know, do, how much power do you have, and does both the... the, the yeah. The charter school and the public school system both report to you, and you said they do, but in D.C. that you it's, don't have it's that. It's different than D.C., so when Kaya was speaking, um, we have a very different uh, setup. So in Los Angeles, the school system, um, my board of education and myself, we are the authorizers, mm -hmm. so we open and close all of the charters um, in your own system. Uh, so any petition that comes is evaluated, then the charters themselves are awarded, uh, charters are closed for um, either failing to meet um, the performance targets or if there are issues. And we monitor charters just like we monitor all of the public schools. And, and when, you're, when you're looking over that, what, what kind of synergies are you trying to create both? Or do you, do you sort of treat them as one as Galapagos Island and the mm -hmm. other sort of mainland? I mean, our, our theory was really clear. Um, we were not confused about our mission in LA. We were there to lift youth out of poverty all youth, and we believe that, uh, you know, transforming human capital, um, strong performance management, and high quality public choice was how we went about that. And so oh, every single parent has the right to a high quality school, a high performing school, and I was totally agnostic um, in the public sector, these are public schools, whether they be public charter schools or tr public traditional schools. And if there is demand, um, I don't believe there should be a waiting list um, for students. They should have those seats. Is there a waiting list? There is a waiting list. How big? Uh, there's probably, well, today, I mean. You went from, what, 80,000 to 130,000 in charter schools? Approximately. We so who, who, who are the 50 other, who, who are beyond the 50,000 you weren't able to bring in? Still waiting for seats, uh, mostly because of geography waiting for seats in their neighborhood. Right. Um, but you, I don't, there should not be one. And, you know, facilities is a very tight locking mechanism. So right. schools can only open if they have a building to open in. We, as a system, chose to provide lots of facilities. So one of the ways of synergy was co-locations. So a school would be built, and uh, the best performing charter would be awarded uh, one part of the campus. Uh, traditional public school awarded the other part of the campus. So a great deal of interaction between professional development, just like uh, Chancellor Freeman. They have just different sports about. teams. Oh, totally different you know, buildings. Yeah. Completely There's different buildings where right. they could compete each other again in the field. Okay, exactly. Allison, take us into DC. You, you're, you know, president of the KIPP schools. I, I understand you have about 15 schools. You're going to open your next. Tell us about the terrain, because my understanding of KIPP, and, and, I, and I realize from, from our chairman's wife who's very involved with, with the KIPP program, there's kind of a KIPP mania going on right now, <laughs> right? You know, KIPP is popping up everywhere. What makes your program so special? I think from the beginning, KIPP has had a very, very distinct focus on culture. And so we start really with a, with a school culture, with a, with a culture around the adults in the building, and building that culture within the students that are in our Culture is a very big word to it me. Is, I don't know what it, it means. It is. It's, it's the kind of thing you can't really put a finger on, but when yeah. you walk into a place, you feel it. And I think, you know, whether you're walking into a KIPP school in L.A. or you're walking into a KIPP school in D.C., they have different 
um, they have a little bit of a different uh, flavor to them, but you know that you're in a place where there's rigor, there's a lot of attention to detail, we sweat the small stuff that's felt from top to bottom, and we're there more hours than it seems like you can count, all in service of, of pushing kids forward. And there's a real and strong a camaraderie around us. In DC, it is a three-year-old through 12 program. So DC, um, we heard earlier, funds three-year-olds as school-age children. Um, and so we actually start with three-year-olds and, and take them all the way through high school. How much Just for the record, KIPP was one of the most astoundingly high-performing charters in our sector. Just remarkable. And when you say, like, how can you tell culture, you walk in and it is college for certain. Every single classroom is named after a university or college. <coughs> Students begin school knowing that they will apply, go to and through. Um, teachers, I mean, literally whatever it takes in terms of understanding the subject matter. It, it just is really kudos. So how does one get into a KIPP school? A lottery. So here in D.C. there's a citywide lottery, and it used to be um, it used to be that each individual charter school and D.C.P.S. runs a separate kind of out of bounds lottery. It used to be a very disparate kind of disorganized system, and over the last couple of years, um, D.C.P.S. and the charter schools came together and created something called My School D.C., which is essentially one place where parents go in and you can rank schools 1 to 12. Um, I'm a parent of DCPS children. I can go in and say I can either go to my neighborhood school or here are the 12 choices I would want for my child. There's a whole algorithm matching that goes on behind the scenes and then parents are awarded the, the match of the school that they get into. And so for us as an operator, it is very, the only thing we know coming in is that the school, that the child would be age appropriate for the grades that we're offering and that they are a DC resident. We have no view into the academic achievement of that child before that they're coming in. We have no view into the poverty level of that child. It's all very kind of um, blind to those characteristics. It's really DC resident and age appropriate for the grades. Charters were basically set up to be an R&D lab mm -hmm. originally to sort of think about best and promising mm -hmm. practices, methodologies, take some risks with new ways to yeah. do things, and then hopefully, you know, the best zingers that came out of that experience would somehow percolate and affect public schools. Mm -hmm. How is that going? I think that's what you see in D.C., which is that we, you know, I, I think it, I, to some degree disagree with just the R&D component. I mean, I think charters were created because parents really wanted a choice besides their neighborhood school, which was struggling. And so mm -hmm. there was a huge demand that just surged, and parents wanted quality. And so in D.C., you see a city where we have 45, 44% of students attending charters. The other 56 are in D.C. public schools um, within the public school environment. And you've gotten to this place where there's a whole lot of options. Um, that doesn't mean that every parent's needs are met or choice is met, um, but you've got an entire environment here where, where parents can choose everything from a Hebrew-based charter school to their neighborhood school that might offer a really robust STEM program. Um, it's, it's really been a, a remarkable place in D.C. The last 10 years, I want to say, Michelle Rhee came in when kind of the, it felt like the, the tension around schools was was highest and, and really took the opportunity for the charter market, which had burgeoned substantially, to really force some improvements in DCPS. And it's why you see Kaya Henderson doing the great sh things she's doing today, because that, that disruption was necessary. What, one of the criticisms of the KIPP program in DC is that it gets to expel students mm -hmm. that, that don't get mm -hmm. the package and, mm -hmm. you know, don't understand. Uh, the behavioral uh, expectations that they have, and so KIPP can expel, mm -hmm. but that, that the traditional school system can't, or, or can't easily do that. Yeah. Do you think it's important to have parity in those sorts of things? I do think it's important to have parity. I, I, I would argue with the notion that we expel for general behaviors. We expel for behaviors that would get you expelled from another school, such as weapons or really dangerous behavior directed at other, other students. I think in in the environment we're in, we are 100% focused on making sure that the students that are there are in a place where they can be safe and they can learn. And the, the arguments around the expulsions are not untrue, but they are a very, very, very small part of what's, what's going on in the, in the environment here. And John, when you were um, opening charter schools and you had a string of what, what I think everyone out there sees as a, a string of highly successful charter schools took off, how did that impact the ecosystem of education? Yeah, so our charter sector our portfolio um, is the highest performing portfolio in the country. And Credo Center just issued that report um, about a year ago. Um, and I think there were two reasons for that. I think we took very, very deliberate steps about how we authorize. So c very similar to what you were saying, the scorecard uh, for which we would hold a regular school 
accountable is the exact same one we would hold charters accountable. So we were tracking suspensions, we would be tracking disproportionality in discipline, achievement, graduation rates, et cetera, et cetera, um, mobility. So it was very transparent. I think that, that the power of that portfolio had a couple of very important effects on the traditional schools in LA. It led to two huge teacher contract changes. One was the expansion without a cap of pilot schools. These are schools that are opened and run by teachers who create the language of their own contract. Mm. Um, and local initiative schools, where is a school can convert itself from a traditional school run under the traditional teacher's contract to completely um, an elect-to-work agreement, uh, but it works just one year and then is elected back. Um, uh, the notions of some examples uh, I'll give you is schools that opened up um, under these things chose to do all parent-teacher conferences uh, by visiting homes, uh, so all the teachers visited the homes of their, of their students. Um, those practices uh, had a very big impact on increasing autonomy, increasing achievement and outcomes for students, and I think deeply connecting with families and communities. If you were superintendent of the DC school system, what would you do? I wouldn't think for a second of not having Kaya Henderson as the <laughs> chancellor. She is absolutely rocking it. She's doing a great job. If you're asking me what would I want in this area that would yeah. be different, I would want authorization uh, in charters. That would be, that would you be. You would want the power of authorization in charters. Yeah, I'd want to be responsible for opening and closing. You know, one of the things we were talking in the back room a bit is. Uh, I, I, I would want yeah. the same laws that we had in California right, around right. that. So David Domenici, <coughs> uh, former Senator Pete Domenici's son, uh, and, a, and a young man named James Foreman Young, back when I knew him, um, started a charter school here in D.C. called the Maya Angelou Charter School, which I understand just operates in a, you know, with, with, with some of the hardest inputs that come out of it. I'm interested in how a school like that exists within, you know, you're in KIPP and it sounds wonderful and great outcomes, but, but give, give us just a quick picture of the, uh, of the tougher places and how you feel about Maya Angelou. Right, I mean, Maya Angelou has been an extraordinary partner from, in the charter school world from, from day one, and, and there, there are, there's a first wave of charters that came in in Maya Angelou and KIPP and Friendship and mm. Thurgood Marshall, a, a wave of early, um, players who came in and really kind of got the groundwork of charters going in the district. And since then, there's been continued growth uh, by a very pro-growth pro authorizer. Um, I think that what is beautiful about the charter space in the city, and is also confusing, and as a parent, I get the, I get the aspect of it that is confusing, um, but there are so many, so many different programs that meet the needs of different students that are out there. And so when you, when you look at the range of programs that are necessary to really meet all students where they are, that's one of the beautiful things about what the charter space can offer. It is, it is back to that R&D component, which is this may not be a program that would ever evolve in a traditional public school right. system, but given the space, they are going to be able to design and implement a program that meets the needs of s some students who have some really, really tough challenges. And the conversations that happen between operators around how can we work together to meet our students that maybe are with KIPP, but Maya Angelou would have a whole lot of strategies for how to address. Those are the conversations that have been happening amongst the leadership for a decade I or more. I wanted to go to the audience, but I'm going to ask you a real quick lightning question. As, as you think about the future of education and the aspirations you both have, can unions be cooperative partners? Can unions be your friends? John? Would you like to go first? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, go I, ahead, John. I, I think the answer is absolutely yes. Um, the track record hasn't shown always yes. But the answer is absolutely yes. I mean, the answer for us is it, it, our, our goal is to keep our teachers in a place where they are in communication with the mm -hmm. leadership in a way that they don't feel the need to kind of organize in a way that, that feels um, contentious. I mean, we are, we're actually, we wake up every day and try and figure out what is the environment we need to create for great teachers to come and be great teachers mm -hmm. so that they can work with, with kids and, and help them be who they want to be. So that, that dynamic is not a piece of our day-to-day -day work. And this isn't just inside of a city. So parenthetically, it was James, who I think is one of America's heroes. Um, that sparked us opening up Apex, a very similar type of charter schools who work with overage, undercredited students in kind of deep peril. Um, very similar. We yeah. learned by the work here at Maya Angelou to do the exact same thing. So I think it travels between cities as well as inside mm -hmm. a city. Interesting. Thank you. Let me open the floor. I saw a woman, I don't know if she still has a question, but in the very far back, she's been trying to ask questions for Are you still trying to ask questions? question? Way, way back? Maybe she's not. Yeah, oh, that's I you. <laughs> I saw your hand up, and I was saying, somebody ask her a question. So can we get her a microphone? Oh, thank you. 
Hi, good morning everybody. I'm Hi. Catherine Roboff. I'm the Executive Director of Higher Achievement. Um, we work with middle school students. We've been hearing a lot today about early childhood, which is of course such an important age, but we also know that middle school is a really important age too. Um, and I'd love to hear um, kind of the supports that you've seen be effective for middle school students and the way that you're addressing their particular needs so that they can stay on a track to high school and college. Great. Allison? Thank you. So middle school has been our bread and butter historically. KIPP schools, um, both in D.C. and nationally, were middle schools. And, and at some point we woke up, and it was really with, with uh, a wake-up call from David and Catherine Bradley here in the district saying, why are you waiting until fifth grade when they you know, may, may or may not be two or three grade levels behind? Why don't you start with three-year-olds and get in front of that? And so we're now in this interesting place where, where we are revising our middle school program because we've had our students since they were three years old. And so they come to us with a, with a whole different set of of academic and social preparedness skills that, that we may not have found when they came directly to us. So we're in the middle of lots of change in, in KIPP DC around middle schools, but it's fundamentally about making it a place that's joyful. And that is, you know, KIPP doesn't always get the impression that it's a good place to be for happiness, that it feels very rigorous and very hard. It's actually a place where there's lots of joy, and middle school students, uh, they need a lot of things, but they need support, and they need to feel like school How is a place where they can be successful. How high is joy on your aspiration list? Uh, it's very high. There, no. There's, a, there's a, a thing called the J factor, which is what, what KIPP schools, when you walk into KIPP schools around the country, there will be a, you know, a commentary and discussion around the J factor, which is how much joy do you feel in this place? Um, we run long days. We run long weeks, and we l run long years. And we can't do that well if we don't make it a fun place to be. John, was joy, good for, was joy, joy important for you? in the Los Angeles schools? Yeah, very much so. Um, <laughs> but much, much more so for the superintendent, actually. But it's, um, so I would say that um, KIPP, LA, Aspire LA, we're really knocking it out of the park around this middle school piece. And if there was one thing I would say that was quite unique was you think a lot about high schools and the whole notion of going to college. It was upper elementary being successful to and through middle school, and that this was going to be something that we were going to be side by side with you. It was very clear. It wasn't some place you just went and hope it worked. Yeah. Yeah. This clock goes really fast. John, let me just ask you, one of the criticisms of your tenure was that you tried to put an iPad in every student's hand. And you know, whether that's the wrong thing to do, right thing to do, I've always been you know, interested in whether technology, I'm going to make the audience really hate me now. Uh, does technology help crunch out the variance in educational experiences? In other words, we talk a lot about great teachers. Joel Klein last night at a dinner talked about a teacher who changed the vector of his life. And sometimes when you have a system this large, you can't base, you can't bet the entire system on finding that teacher. Does technology provide a way not to be so dependent on human beings? No, that wasn't the point at all. The point was really simple, and that is what almost everybody in this room has, every youth in Los Angeles should have. Mm -hmm. And just because some of you live under a freeway, and some of you, are many, many, many of you um, are homeless and not documented, um, they should have access the exact same way as every student was. It was a youth rights agenda. And when the agenda is actually solely based on the rights of youth, uh, heretofore certainly not lifted and not helped, um, that can come in conflict with what adults want. Um, so um, glad to take the criticism. You know, we, I chose very much not to be a witness in this job, um, but to actually be very mindful about the rights of students. It was never about replacing adults whatsoever. It was about access. Alison, do your students have iPads? Um, we are one-to-one. -one. They don't necessarily have iPads, but we're basically one-to-one -one from first grade through so seniors in high school, primarily because the, the assessment environment is, is an increasingly highly technological environment. And so to be ready for assessments, they have to be ready to operate on technology. I'm such an advocate of KIPP <laughs> robot teachers of the future. That, that is uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, I don't under underestimate the, I mean, the power of robotic the mistake, teaching. <laughs> the mistake uh, that, <laughs> <laughs> that folks would make is say, we, you know, we've got this great teacher, and let's really tech up in this other classroom where we've got a teacher who needs work. That's the, that's the biggest mistake. You actually want the technology with the teacher who's, who's got the whole system set up, and you really want more human support in the, in the classrooms where teachers are still learning. Right, we're at him. Ladies and gentlemen, Allison Fansler, President and Chief Operating Thank Officer of KIPP DC, and John Dacey, Superintendent in Residence at the Broad Center for the Management of School System. Thank you both very much.